On the line with me today is TV vet, veterinary surgeon and Sky Television presenter Luke Gamble. Luke has travelled the globe helping sick animals and raising awareness and is the founder and chief executive of Worldwide Veterinary Service, Mission Rabies and director of Pet Air UK and Pet Air South Africa. In 2010, Luke was awarded the J.A. White Memorial Award for outstanding contributions to the welfare of companion animals. He believes the challenges of life are always a matter of perspective. And my goodness, has he gone for it. Luke, it's a pleasure to have you on the programme. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much. How did it all begin, Luke? What inspired you to make a difference? Well, I think qualifying as a vet was just uh, sort of the end of a long journey of something I always wanted to do from about the age of 10. And I started working in a mixed practice in the West Country and absolutely loved it. I remember, though, the grounding that being a vet wasn't just about fixing animals. It was very much about helping the people who own the animals, working with them, and that there was another side to it, which was the economics, which was really the fact that ultimately it's a business. You know, it supports a livelihood. And it was just another dimension to being a vet. I hadn't really factored into the equation. And I guess, in all honesty, I was a touch disillusioned by those sort of harder realities of it, especially in the farm work and the fact that animals are essentially production animals and and you're there to just make them work and do their job. And chatting to a friend about it, he suggested, he said, look, come out and um, help me with a charity project. I'm going out to spend a week helping some cats. So I went out to a, an island and helped this lovely little charity run by a very altruistic lady helping cats. And we, we knew to these cats, and it was, just, it was just really enjoyable. And I rapidly followed that up with another trip out to an island, Samos, in in Greece to help a dog shelter that was on the ropes there uh, another holiday and I just found it utterly inspiring that the individuals running these small little charities around the world who had given a lot of themselves up their own personal finances to to make a difference to to champion animal welfare uh, and to really help the vulnerable and I thought for me it was a venture to get out and see places and explore the world and and also the fact I could apply my trade without any economic constraint, just being a vet for the sake of being a vet, enjoying it, having fun, meeting new people, and and also that fact that I gained a lot from it. So you went about to sort of found Worldwide Veterinary Service, and recently you've had a very interesting project in Armenia. Tell me about that, rescuing the lions from the world's saddest zoo. Sounds terrible. I oh, know, really sad. The charity's been going now about 12 years. It's become a much bigger entity in what it does. It sends vet teams, nurses, drug support equipment out to non-profit organisations, animal charities around the world. And we were doing a big project on the streets of Yerevan to try and stop the dog culling that's going on there by the mayor. And we've sent in a tender to offer a humane population control proposal or strategy to um, sort the dogs out. Whilst the team were over there working very hard, the story broke in the mail about these bears and lions that were the world's saddest zoo, as you said, you know, in these tiny cages, and they're only an hour and a half away. And what had happened, essentially, was a very rich businessman had abandoned the zoo. He got into debt and trouble. He left the animals he had in his own private zoo to languish and starve to death. They're in these tiny little hideous cages. And so we, we sort of got stuck into that to, to get them out. And within a week we had the bears out and moved and they are now uh, going to go to a bear sanctuary in Romania and the lions we've got in a wildlife sanctuary and we're hopefully going to fly them back to the UK that's the grand plan. Fantastic and have they made a full recovery because it did sound that they were in a very poor condition. Yeah the mother lion the lion so it's the three lions they're all lionesses and there's a mother and two daughters and the mother is quite ill she's got a sort of pneumonia and so we're having to get her treated she's on some fairly hardcore antibiotics now to pull around through that and um, then of course the next step is to find a home for them the reality of it is these lions will never get released into the wild because they'd never survive they could cope in that environment no. and if we can give them a really decent quality of life then that would be just wonderful what's the difference in treating domestic and exotic animals because obviously you weren't initially trained i don't think in in treating exotic animals yeah i mean you do you do a little bit of it but every animal's different you've got to learn about their physiology and their metabolism you know how they metabolize drugs you know but essentially getting an animal out of pain is getting an animal out of pain stitching up a wound on dog is very similar to stitching up on anything else really you do adapt to it and it's more the aspects like the anesthesia and the handling that is the really hard bit 
Do you think it is a lack of education about animals and the fundamental reason for mistreatment in poor communities that's the problem? I've worked in some of the poorest and the hottest places in the world. I've worked in refugee camps, I've worked in really horrible places, and every single place I've seen amazing acts of kindness and altruism. I think you get baddies in every walk of life. You get very wealthy, well-educated people who completely neglect their animals, um, as well as poor people who neglect their animals. And it is... It's staggering sometimes when you go to townships or communes where you just see people who basically sacrifice, you know, anything for their animals. Some it's a big thing. Yeah, some cases must be heartbreaking. Do you, do you ever get affected by it, or is that something that you learn to to manage as a vet? I think the moment I don't get affected by putting down an animal is the moment I have to stop being a vet. I mean, I, I do, and I find it harder now, sort of 17 years out. But it's always a last resort, you know, ultimately trying to champion animal welfare, champion animal life. And that's that's really what it's all about. So it's really sad when you can't do that. What are the lengths you have to go to to get the medication and treatment in poorer countries? Because sometimes I should think it's a huge challenge, isn't it? Sometimes it's fantastically easy. You know, some of these places you can buy almost anything anywhere. Here, it's trying to get antibiotics in the UK it can be really difficult but in other parts of the world you literally just go on some antibiotics just rock up at a corner shop and you can just get anything. Training programmes do you provide that with the WVS or how do you go about getting volunteers involved and do you train abroad in the local communities as well as back in the UK how does it work? Yeah we do we've got two international training centres so in the last five years WVS has sent about 370 vet teams which are volunteers of vets and nurses and non-vets and non non-vet nurses to go off on trips around the world and we provide regular support to charities and we've directly helped over about 150,000 animals in these various wow, places we that's work. amazing. Uh, we've got about 700 charities registered with us and we've sent out about £2 million worth of veterinary supplies in the last five years. For the veterinary training bit, we have trained in these places over 1,200 vets now and we do that in two main places, mainly in India. We've got an international training centre there which runs these 12-day surgical training courses for vets and we've got another centre in Thailand in Chiang Mai where we do exactly the same thing and we'll probably get one in Malawi in Africa where we're doing a big rabies project it'd be nice to dovetail that in and have a veterinary training centre there too. What are the biggest lessons that you've learnt whilst on the road? I think the biggest lesson is that any one of us can make a difference in our corner of the world. It is about the power of the person and the individual to not quit, to seize the day and to do what they believe in. And that can have an absolute real effect directly in the issue that they, they want to champion. I think that the ability of uh, knowing that that you can do it, you can make that difference, has been a wonderful lesson, you know, and, and it really empowering, I think, in life. How has it enriched your, your life as a vet doing your Sky programme, being a TV presenter? Yeah, I mean, that was that was really good fun. It's a while ago now, and it was, it was absolutely fantastic. But they phoned up out the blue and came out with me to the IDP camps in Kenya and filmed that off the cuff. It was a bit too sad to put on TV, but it caught the eye of the execs, and they commissioned a two five-part series, you know, following us around the world. It helped the charity lots. Amazing. Uh, it empowered me lots. I loved it. It was great to sort of showcase that work. And it's enriched my life because I love that challenge. I love being able to be a vet in these places. And selfishly, I love the travel, the adventure and the capacity and scope to to work with all these different species and, and feel that sense. I'm helping them where they wouldn't otherwise be vets or veterinary help. Tell me about uh, Mission Rabies, because I hear that you've got to, well, you've inoculated or going to inoculate 50,000 dogs in 30 days. I mean, how do you go about doing that? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the thing with the rabies, Mission Rabies started out as a project of WVS, and literally it was working in India, and I saw these rabid dogs and put them down, but they'd bitten other dogs in this little village in the middle of nowhere. And I remember standing there looking at these dogs that no one could catch, and oh, these gosh. small children playing in the street, no. thinking those dogs are going to turn rabid, and it's worse than having like a tiger loose in this street. It's the world's deadliest disease, so there's a 99% fatality, but virtually 100% fatality once someone shows clinical signs. And it's fantastically easy to treat over 99 percent of all rabies human cases are carried through dog bites and the way you eliminate disease is through vaccinating dogs and if you vaccinate 70 percent of dogs in an area that herd immunity gets rid of the disease every disease is categorized by how infectious it is so if i have flu or measles that they would have an r naught of about 15 or 20 which means i'll infect 15 or 20 other people before i either get better or i die Rabies has an R0 value of about 1.2, which is incredibly low. 
So that means a rabid dog will infect, on average, about 1.2 other dogs before it dies. Now, to get a disease to die out, you have to lower that R0 value below 1. So you don't have to do much work to eliminate rabies. It's that simple to get rid of. You literally have to vaccinate a certain proportion of the population and then the, the odds are skewed so that rabid dogs will actually bite already vaccinated animals that then won't be able to pass the disease on to lower that disease and that will get rid of rabies. Um, and the reason it's not done is because it's a animal problem in a human scenario. So is a, as a, kids are dying, it's mainly kids that die one every nine minutes from rabies and it's caused Gosh. by dog bites, but doctors are not going to go and catch dogs and vaccinate them, so it needs vets to do that. And that's where we can step in and do it. And that was the indicator to say, look, crumbs, we should just crack on and power this through. There's a hospital called the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Blantyre in Malawi, which is a country in sort of southern Africa. And that annually recorded the highest instance of child rabies deaths from any, any single institution in the whole of Africa. And uh, within 12 months, we got a grant and a team on the ground, and we vaccinated 35,000 dogs in that city in 20 days. And Incredible. they've had, they've only had, still tragically sad, they've had two deaths since that campaign um, launched. And now we'll do it again this year, and we'll do it again next year, and we'll make that hospital the lowest in the whole of Africa. And we'll, we will do that. We'll eliminate rabies in that area, and we'll expand that program out. And they're not that expensive. You know, we can do that whole city for about £100,000. And that is staggeringly great mm. value, bang for buck. You know, literally, that is all it takes. So donations we get go strictly towards that, and we're very transparent, and that's what we do. Luke, how can people go about supporting you? Well, wvs.org.uk is the website for Worldwide Veterinary Service. They can look at the trips, the projects, and get stuck in. And if they like donkeys or want to help, uh, you know, horses or dogs or cats and little charities around the world, that's the one to go for, and we can really help there. If there's stirs more to help the kids and eliminate rabies, missionrabies.com, and then we'd love their help with that, and they can come out on trips, they can give us some money, they can, uh, you know, just spend out a bit of their time, or even just some feedback and advice on what we're doing, we all great, gratefully received and appreciate it. Luke, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, wishing you the best of luck for continued success. Great to chat. Thanks so much.